Well, thank you so, so much, Peter. And uh, I must say it's a pleasure just to look out at uh, so many friends and colleagues here that we've known over the years. And uh, great to know that we're working uh, for the advancement of uh, commercial vehicle safety. And of course, that's the mandate uh, of FMCSA. And uh, so the, the uh, I guess the confrontation uh, uh, of the safety technologies and, and how they are contributing to the management and uh, logistics uh, possibilities is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to try to keep this relatively current uh, as opposed to looking too far out in the future. But I as an outline, I, I, you know, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to touch on today, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the relationship between safety technology and the management practice. And this has to do with management practice just is focusing on safety outcomes. Uh, the onboard safety technologies themselves, uh, management practice reliant on safety technology because some of them are not. Some safety technologies don't transfer well to supporting management. Uh, driver acceptance of uh, onboard technology, new roles for multimodal um, uh, freight movement, reliable, reliant on uh, onboard technology, and that's really the interplay between the two. So this is a very uh, small part of the picture because of the relevance. And then finally, uh, the barriers to development of transformational technologies. So let's talk about the relationship between safety uh, technology and management practice. Th there's an interesting uh, concept at play where we have a technology that you can purchase and we have management techniques for safety that you can employ. And those, if they're separated and independent, will give you a suboptimal safety performance outcome. However, if you can integrate those systems, if you can integrate the technology with the safety management practice, then you can get best safety. And ultimately, that's what we are striving to. I mean, my goal is cr trucks that don't crash. I told you that this morning. And and this is how we have to get there, is, is a real integrated systems approach to uh, making a vehicle that refuses to crash, even if you attempt to do so. So what do I mean, and what are the relevant safety technologies? Well, I've, I've got 10 up here, and these are available today. And, and I've broken them into uh, two categories. Uh, on the, on the, right -hand or the left hand side, you're seeing uh, driver plus management, that's where the two can interplay. And then on the right-hand side, driver only. So uh, stability control and also role stability control, uh, both electronic stability, uh, which can handle roll and yaw uh, correction of the vehicle, and rollover stability, uh, rollover uh, technologies. Those are, pr are uh, can send uh, information to management to tell them that, that an event has occurred and alert management to the fact that, yeah, there has been an event. Now, this kicks in when the driver or the vehicle exceeds certain performance thresholds. You have overspeed alert. So these systems are tied, uh, they incorporate GPS, and in the mapping, uh, the localized speed uh, limits are within the software so that the vehicle knows what speed it should be traveling. And if the vehicle is over speed, again, an alert can go to the management to say, hey, the vehicle is speeding through this particular zone. Uh, forward control and crash mitigation braking. This is the great technology that looks ahead at what the traffic is doing, and it, and it uh, controls the vehicle speed. We call this adaptive cruise control. And if there is a conflict that arises, then the brakes are put on irrespective of what the driver does. So, so they are uh, semi-autonomous uh, systems that help with longitudinal control. And again, when occurrences happen, when you hit certain thresholds, for example, aggressive braking or, or events where this technology is taking over, this information can be fed back into head office. Uh, electronic logbook, th this is the sleeper of the technologies, and I'm going to cover this a little later, but I'm very impressed with what this is doing in terms of development. In-cab cam cameras, very, very controversial, as you well understand, and forward-facing cameras, less so, uh, because of the uh, invasion of privacy that drivers sometimes feel. 
On the driver-only side, uh, lane keeping and departure tends to be in that area. Adaptive cruise control tends to be in that area. Automated uh, manual transmissions, uh, we don't necessarily think of them as, as safety devices, but when you think about how they relieve the driver of that aspect of the driving task, then there's more uh, energy, there's more ability to deal with the present dangers that they have to face. And the other one, uh, the last one here is disc brakes, and, and uh, quite exciting to see what drivers think about disc brakes, and I will enlighten you on that a little bit later on. So let's talk about the uh, innovative evolution of safety technology supporting management and logistics. So this, this is the sleeper. The electronic logging device was uh, originally conceived as a, as a mechanism of, of tracking hours of service, driver hours. Now, I in the in innovation side, companies are now putting in GPS systems and communication uh, uh, upgrades to these systems so that they become a sort of a vehicle systems reporting tool. And it not only talks about the driver, but it talks about the vehicle, the vehicle state, and so forth. And, and since it's going to be a mandated technology at the end of this year, uh, you know, I think in all likelihood, uh, it'll become the central node for truck communications of the future because it's going to be in every truck. And, and uh, therefore, I think you know, there's a sort of a brilliant unintended consequence here that's come about because of innovation from the private sector who are developing these systems. Uh, well, what do I mean by that? Well, we're seeing now that these logging devices, um, uh, the, the data that they produce is keeping dispatchers up to date on the driver and, and delivery status. So that's more than hours of service. It's certainly providing the um, identification, early identification of potential hours of service violations, which allows your uh, dispatchers to make changes. It identifies drivers who are already in uh, violation, and that's through real-time data. Um, it provides data on the available hours left for a driver to complete a job. So again, in logistics, uh, supply chain management, and so forth, very important. Uh, it determines if a, a driver hours contribute to inefficient vehicle use. So you know where the vehicle is, how it's performing, you can see how the driver has progressed through the day. Uh, supports comprehensive driver coaching programs through interaction and continually assesses job assignments uh, to improve e efficiency. And, and these are because of the innovation that has been built in to the central basic idea of a, of a system tracking drivers. And if we take it to the next level, you know, there's some well-known um, mapping device uh, companies out there, and, and one of them ha has created an ability to customize a driver task list. They've integrated the dispatch systems, uh, resulting in uh, automatic flow for trip information, status and updates and so forth, completed forms. Uh, and that's a big deal, especially in intermodal freight. And then the other one is turn-by-turn -turn, uh, navigation is incorporated in them that, that takes into account things like vehicle road restrictions, uh, such as weight, uh, length, height limits, and so forth, as well as uh, hazardous material routing. So, so, okay, so you had this little idea of something to make sure a driver behaves themselves in terms of their hours of service and suddenly you have a single technology that has morphed. Why? Because you have a platform that's easy to build on that people realize is going to be in every truck and, and therefore it's open to uh, lots of innovation from, from the private sector. What about uh, management practices reliant on safety technology? Well, we, we, as part of this exercise, um, we examined uh, seven fleets uh, which were heavily invested in the deployment of safety technology and advanced management practice. And I like to call them the Safety Adoption for Economic Return Group, which has a nice acronym of SAFER. And uh, so in this analysis, we interviewed the safety executives of these very, very good companies uh, who are early adapters of technology and uh, rigorous um, on their safety uh, systems. 
And we also did a driver survey to understand uh, how they uh, viewed the technology and the management practices. A and finally, uh, we also included a literature review of safety management practice uh, so that we could get the, uh, a feel for what aspects of management are conducive to the technology. So in terms of uh, the output of the safety management literature, uh, I've got a bullet list here of what uh, works, or sorry, what doesn't work. I'm leading with what doesn't work first. So the culture of fear, not a great idea. Termination threats, not a great idea. Customer is always right. Well, we always thought that was right, but apparently not. So because, you know, sometimes a, a customer is wrong about safety. Adversarial approach to training, the cop and robber notion, uh, as opposed to coaching, and coaching has a very positive uh, reinforcement type approach. Uh, incentives without recognition, doesn't work. Uh, generic uh, safety programs apparently don't work. And uh, pretending compliance is the same thing as safety. And I think that point was brought up earlier today by somebody uh, in our meeting this morning. Now, uh, what uh, management elements seem to work? Um, well, I've got a color-coded list here, and, and the um, top uh, list are sort of independent elements, and the bottom uh, blue ones, I think, are ones that can be tied to that technology and benefit from this safety technology. So messages from the top leadership through uh, all departments of the company to, to drivers is key. That sort of consistency. Constant verbal communication. So always being on task with safety is really important. Participation and buy-in for all departments, just not the safety department. So this has to do with we're all in the same boat, we're all living at the same standards and so forth. And then the uh, internal cooperation across departments. So as we move in now thinking about the technology and how it can support certain management functions that seem to work, well, education, training, and how to do things right. This feedback loop from the technology helps support that in, uh, aspect. Balanced positive and negative reinforcement. Again, how do you determine um, where the negative element is that you have to explain, and how can you source out positive, uh, positive behavior? Well, you can get that again from this incoming uh, technology data flow that, that comes back to home office. Uh, demonstrated management uh, commitment to safety. Again, investment in safety technology is a good example of that, but also these very strong management programs reinforce that. Uh, screening during hiring, obviously, uh, and that can be done during the hiring training process where you're getting feedback from the technology. And simple, consistent, repeatable safety messages. Again, the data helps support that. So, I mean, one of the problems of m measuring the performance, safety performance of these fleets is they, they're really, really good fleets. So they don't have a lot of accidents. So you can't go to your normal crash data performance to assess crash performance. So what we did is we used the uh, <coughs> FMCSA uh, uh, basics <laughs> and we used, because we, were, we had some fleets that were hazardous material fleets, we couldn't use all of the metrics. So we thought, okay, let's focus on the real killers. And th this is the unsafe driving, hours of service, and vehicle maintenance. We felt those were really good indicators of safety. And we just simply aggregated those scores for each fleet. And you know, lo and behold, within a group of very safe fleets, it really did show quite a distribution in the safety performance and turned out to be a very useful me metric for what we were trying to get at. So when we looked at these fleets and we looked at the numbers of technologies that were placed in vehicles by those fleets and then plotted that against their safety score, we saw a very strong relationship between the number of technologies per truck against the safety score of the company. And better safety in this curve is a lower number. So you can see that the more safety technologies you deploy, uh, the better the safety is. So it's quite a strong relationship. 
Um, when you look further at the number of trucks in the fleet against the safety score, that also is very telling. Uh, and we find that, I mean, as, as much as I do it in our resource allocations you have in the larger companies to devote full time to active safety management. So, so what I think this does is it uh, contributes and fills a prescription that it's not just technology, but it's also the function of safety management. So it, it seems to me that uh, it supports that early graphic I put up where if you simply rely on the technology, you're going to have a suboptimal outcome. But if you can uh, couple that with strong management uh, techniques uh, invested in the company, then you're going to get very good outcomes. So unfortunately, there is a, a problem about uh, critical mass within fleet size and safety outcome. That's what it appears to be. So this is an interesting slide. This is the results of the survey we did with drivers. And we had them rate uh, the accepted, their, their feelings of acceptance to a technology and their satisfaction with the functioning of that technology. <coughs> and there are subtle differences in these two things, but um, the main thing is that highest on the list is this great. And uh, that was a surprise to me. But when you consider that disc brakes are inher inherently always uh, in adjustment, they don't go out of adjustment. And when they have uh, very, very powerful and consistent retardation capability, uh, this is something that drivers are seeing, but it's also a technology they use every day, multiple times a day, so they're highly familiar with it. But anyway, that to me was a very f refreshing finding. They also apparently really like transmissions, autom automatic transmissions. And also scored high was the electronic logbook because I guess that's really saving them some time and it's a allowing the ambiguous element of paper timekeeping and multiple logbooks to disappear. So now things are pretty straight and they, they can defend themselves with that. Um, so those were the three very highly effective technologies that drivers felt uh, were at play. Uh, they. Uh, you know, in terms of the middle ground, effective technologies, then we can see that list there, and I think there are no real surprises in there. And then the less effective technology rated by drivers is the in-cab facing camera, so the, face, the camera that is facing on the driver, and that should be no surprise to anybody. But when, when I did measure that, I looked at that response against the safety outcome of the company, and what was very interesting was the safer fleet Drivers in the safer fleet were much more tolerant of the in-facing camera than the drivers in the less safe fleets. And again, so, so I think we just, th this is a nut we have to crack, and, and as long as the drivers appreciate that it's to their benefit in, in terms of defending action and so forth, and not a snooping or a fishing expedition to test them, um, you know, I think their acceptance grows. When I asked the executives essentially the same, questions, there were differences. And the main difference is that the highest rating technology <coughs> from the driver was the technology that they use most frequently. From the executive, safety exec, uh, executive point of view, they, they were more uh, abstract in the sense that they felt stability control, forward collision uh, control and braking, um, you know, those came in very, very high, and they should, because they are the things that help correct mistakes drivers make, okay? And, and that's a really important concept, because we're all fallible, and if we get technology being able to correct our mistakes, then that's a great thing. So, but everything else lined up about the same, and, 
uh, but what was really interesting from the executive point of view was the <coughs> notion that less effective technology were uh, the cameras, whether in cab or forward facing, if you didn't incorporate coaching with them. So if you, so if you were to incorporate coaching, they moved uh, uh, from a um, very less uh, effective technology into an effective technology. So again, very enlightening. So uh, new roles for multimodal freight movement related to onboard technology. Well, I can't see, I guess, it, well, first of all, I looked at the national multimodal freight analysis framework uh, data challenges. That yeah, this is a great group. They, they, they sort of had, a, had a, a workshop that looked at, well, what are the key elements? Well, data, of course, is king when it comes to a lot of the um, uh, modal uh, freight and, uh, and logistics and so forth. And um, you can see this list here that, you know, y you need to be applying data for reasoning, like the what if scenarios, uh, uh, the uh, trends and pattern analysis. That's really important to the to multi model, modal uh, freight uh, uh, planning. Um, provisional and future year, year estimation, inadequate cost and temporal factors. The calibration and validity, uh, val validation of problems are uh, d due to a lack of uh, reference data. So these, these are challenges they're facing. In insufficient geographic s scale and data deficiencies of, uh, you know, coverage. Aggregation and sparseness, consistency and accuracy. These, these are well-known problems that we face uh, with data. So, and of course, the ac accurate capture of transfers among modes. So what's this telling us? I mean, it's just telling us that data is king. And when we think about the ability for new technologies to provide data from the vehicle that can be used uh, for not only multimodal, but also for uh, logistics and so forth, uh, this, this, uh, this becomes a very big part, I think, of the future benefit and the contribution. And again, where does that reside? Well, it really resides in this uh, hours of service uh, data, you know. Uh, th this, uh, the, you know, it, it, that's where it's coming from, I think. So when we look at the critical need for model m multimodal transport, uh, well, you uh, need to achieve an internationally compliant system. Uh, th th that is because so much of multimodal transfer crosses borders. And... Um, by definition. And it's got to be safe, it's got to be compliant, it's got to be sustainable, paperless, and un unencumbered by red tape to the extent we can do, reliable, cost, effect, uh, cost effective, and timely. And uh, fast if needed, but slow if possible. Because, you know, the fast transfer um, takes, takes a, a lot of really high quality um, energy, we'll say, and uh, resources within your transport uh, supply chain. Whereas if you can reduce the speed uh, where possible, then you can make some substantial savings. In other words, not everything has to be delivered tomorrow. One of the things that uh, Europe is uh, focusing on at the moment is the unified documentation. So. The standardized and in, inoperable uh, systems uh, within uh, uh, documentation for uh, uh, freight transfer, uh, the, the need to protect and secure information, uh, electronic documentation, and increased data sharing. So there's some been some very encouraging happenings with the United Nations Convention on uh, uh, Contract for uh, International Carriage of Goods, and, and, and they've done some uh, changes li lately to their legal uh, protocols uh, to allow for uh, electronic documentation uh, in the road sector. So that, that has been an encouraging development. Um, let's move on now to barriers to the development of uh, transformational change. Um, you know, when you, when you think about uh, transformational technology there, they tend to be inventive rather than planned, okay? So take, for example, flight. Well, 
you know, I think the great scientists throughout all ages dreamt about flight. And it was really only the invention of the internal combustion engine that made flight practical. You had a power. And the next p p piece of the puzzle was, well, how do you develop a propeller? Then what kind of wings do you need? And the Wright brothers did all that. So, and it starts out very, very innocently. Yes, you, you, you see the dream, but the barrier is some enabling technology. But it doesn't appear, we're not all of a sudden in a 747, you know, we're in a little, little plane that goes about 200 meters and that's about it. But over the years, we get development and then it comes. And really, the marketplace validates the relevance of that technology by and large, okay? I would say the exceptions are safety technology where if given to their own devices, and we see this right now in the trucking industry, so many, much of the safety technology is not making it into the market. It should be. Stuff that's mandated certainly is, and some good things happen when you do that. So, but by and large, a lot of transformational technology, uh, you know, the marketplace will the validate its relevance. But uh, the barriers include institutional and regulatory stagnation, uh, and you know, the other barrier is time for evolution. There's a certain amount of patience required. It's just uh, part of the process. So when we look on uh, onboard uh, technology, the main barrier appears to be uh, a lack of system maturity and its standardized requirements due to the early stage of transport system digital integration, I would say. Um, and um, I think understanding that particular issue. Um, I think that the new technology that's coming on board is going to enable this to move along for us. So I guess in conclusion, um, and I've had to be very quick on this because of limited time, but the, uh, the number of safety technologies per truck is a strong indicator of overall fleet safety performance. And you can argue that is it the technology or is the management that invests in that technology and the culture that resides there that causes them to invest in the technology? You know, there's a, there's a bit of all of that in there, but I think the, the technology is huge. Uh, fleet size was found to have an influence on safety outcome when you talk about the contribution of the management piece. Safety technologies that provide uh, direct digital feedback to the safety management were found uh, to support better safety outcomes. Onboard safety technologies present new opportunities for management and logistics in the road transport industry. And it looks like the improvements in multimodal freight uh, are related to onboard safety technology, uh, you know, but they require standardized, accurate, and timely data transfer. And it appears that the uh, electronic logbook uh, perform, uh, you know, platforms offer a means of enabling standardized information and data for use in multimodal freight movement and also in logistics. And then the barriers to innovation uh, and deployment. Um, you know, there's a, there is this notion of uh, system clarity, maturity, and uh, then uh, the lack of standardized international systems. So that uh, concludes uh, my talk for today, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have.